All right, everybody. This is episode seven of Insights of All Trades. Thanks for joining us again. Cole, nice to see you. What's up, dude? Long time no see you. Yeah, it's been about a month, maybe a little bit more. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, I'm back from Oklahoma. How was that? Yeah, it was it was pretty good. I mean, Oklahoma itself, I didn't love. It was just very... <laughs> it kind of alternated between dry and humid, but the whole time it was just hot. And... Uh, it's not as green as Pennsylvania. It's just, I don't know. I don't think I could live in Oklahoma, especially Fort Sill. But um, it was a good experience. I'm glad to be back. Um, I definitely learned a lot about the military and about the Army. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to moving forward with that. So pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So today we have John Hershey. And he is? He is the, the state representative in Pennsylvania for the 82nd Legislative District, where, which is where we're from. And right. he's actually one of our good friend's older brother, uh, yeah. who uh, could be a future guest. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're super excited to bring you this episode. For Nick and I personally, we aren't very politically educated, as you may have guessed from <laughs> our, our, our pilot episode and following episodes. And if you're looking for a good stepping stone, I'd say, of not only getting educated about how state politics operate, but how to get educated about politics, mm -hmm. I'd say this is a very informative episode. Yeah, regardless of your party. So John is a Republican, but he gives us a lot of insight on basically how to uh, tease out the news and, and what to follow. So he's not going to preach to you to follow Fox News, and he's not going to preach to you, obviously, to follow the um, you know the more left-leaning news media. He's going to tell you kind of how to be an informed voter and an informed individual in America. So, Yeah, he's a very clearly a critical thinker, and he speaks about that a lot on the podcast, so looking yeah, forward to Very driven dude, too. Yeah, so. absolutely. Kind of runs with the theme of people we're getting on here so far but um, <laughs> yeah so for today's podcast brought to you by my friend jesse who's from everett washington so this is an insight we got coming in. yeah <laughs> our insight there's a lot a lot coming at you here but i th i think it's a good one to unpack so jesse says follow your passions and never stop chasing your dreams Doing what you're passionate about is fulfilling in every aspect. Chasing your dreams, to me, means you still have a wonderful sense of hope and a will to defy odds. But the most beautiful thing about passions and dreams is they are malleable. They change and take new forms throughout your life. So if you keep pushing and following what you love at every turn, when you look back, your life is a story of a hero who, above all, did what they love and always gave 100%. It's interesting that everyone gets to choose how they do it, but for me, that's how I give my life meeting. That'll be it for my best advice to live by. Also, hot chicks and kung fu. Can't beat that. <laughs> Jesse's words, not ours, but I think there's a lot of tangible insight there in that, I don't know, go ahead, what do you think about that insight? So the dreaming's a big thing. Um, I just finished up a podcast, I think with Jordan Peterson I was listening to, I, want to say, I think it was Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson. And, and Jordan Peterson talks about how important it is to set goals towards your dreams, but set them in like a manner that they're achievable, like within a, a reasonable time frame. So like if you want to be a, oh, I don't know, if you want to be an astronaut, don't set your goal as, well, so you can set your goal as wanting to be an astronaut, but don't set that as your only goal. You want to set your steps of becoming an astronaut. In tangible increments. Yeah, to exactly, get there. so that you can get there. So dreaming, you got to have that big overall dream of what you want to do, but you have to know and figure out the, the necessary steps to do that and, and set those goals accordingly. But even though you are being incremental in how you set those goals, still be willing to think bigger. Yeah, in, absolutely. In, in that yeah. you know, level of dream that you can accomplish. Yeah, so that's pretty cool insight, and obviously hot chicks come through. <laughs> <laughs> In the words of Jesse Lopez, can't beat it. <laughs> so shout out to Jesse, thanks for that insight, and if you have any insights you want to share, feel free to send it to us on any of our social media platforms. We'd really appreciate it. And, and we also, we're, we're definitely open to feedback. We know we've, there's been a few like, you know, just digital and audio, like, Hiccups. Hiccups in these first few episodes. And not always things that we pick up on ourselves. So, 
you know, if you have good um, critical advice for us, we're not going to get offended if you tell us. That. We'd love it. Yeah, truthfully. we would really like to hear your guys' feedback on on what's going on and, and if you guys are enjoying the shows, if you don't enjoy them, if they're too long, too short, you know, just anything, um, let us know. So, yeah. So we got John Hershey coming on here in a couple minutes, uh, and we're really excited to introduce him to you guys. So stay tuned. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to Insights of All Trades with Cole and Nick. This is where we talk to people we meet along our journeys through medicine, military service, sports, education, and beyond. We hope you enjoy. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Insights of All Trades podcast. You're with us for episode seven, and we got John Hershey with us today. He is the representative for the 82nd Legislative District, and we're super happy to have you on. What's going on? Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming, man. This is awesome. Uh, It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, I think last time I saw you was probably a few years ago, but... I was just upstairs in my brother's bedroom, and I saw the little, uh, what is it, like a business card, basically, that had uh, Gilbert Hershey oh, yeah. running yeah. for class president. Absolutely. Yeah, so <laughs> that was pretty interesting. It reminded me of, like, you've pretty much been into politics, I guess, since high school at least, right? Yeah, that was that was not my first public office, but that was my first time running for office, was with, with your brother. And it was a lot of fun. I think I remember sitting in this house making political buttons for hours on end yeah and so it was guys, a lot of fun i think you guys handed out hershey kisses and stuff too. we did yeah yeah <laughs> smooth, smooth did you guys win star. that oh uh, we did nice. so we were in a i think five or six way republican primary or yeah. it was it was the cherokee party at the time and the apache party because we're the junietta indians right okay um <laughs> and chris was actually the class above me and it was a mock election to go along with barack obama's election um and I decided I wanted to pick a person in a different class that would help me win. Um, and Chris was well-known and obviously <laughs> well-liked. Uh, and so I picked him, and we ran and won, beat some seniors. Hey. Um, <laughs> what year were you? Not to call out any of their names. They're my friends now. Um, I was a sophomore at the okay, time. Okay, gotcha. And Chris was a junior. And we ran, did not know what we were doing, but we had fun. And it was really what kind of got me interested in this kind of thing. This and... My grandfather actually served as a legislator as well in the Lancaster, Chester County area. And I got to hear a lot about the good that politics can do for people. So you hear a lot about all the negative stuff. You hear people complaining, you know, this person lies. They all lie. They all steal our money. They all cheat. But I got to see from a pretty early age the good it can do for people and what he was doing to help people in their everyday lives, both with state agencies and enacting legislation. And so that's what got me interested. And then this opportunity came up with Chris. And I said, you know, this is a chance for me to represent my school to the administration and to the board. And I decided to go for it. And I don't know that Chris and I were the odds on favorites, but we did win. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Can, can you give us a couple like examples of some of the good that you've seen through your grandfather in politics? Sure. Well, he did a lot of things that we still discuss today. So he wrote acre legislation, which is ag legislation that can help farmers get around some certain municipal regulations and things like that, that are unconstitutional from a state level. And um, we still talk about that today, changes to the acre law. And it's fun to think about because he wrote that. (laughs) And it's something that he wrote, I think it was 2003 or 2004, that we still talk about it in everyday politics today. And it's helped a lot of farmers combat things like high municipal regulations or uh, just low commodity prices and things like that. So that was pretty cool. But then you hear all kinds of other bizarre stories as well. He helped one of his neighbors get a skunk out from under a porch <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's just there was a lot of concrete things that he did. Um, and that was a time when Republicans were very environmental oriented as well. So he was served on the Chesapeake Bay Commission okay. and he wrote a lot of the policies – with, with soil concentration and nitrogen in the soil and things like that to help the Chesapeake Bay get cleaned up. And people liked that because he was a farmer. And oftentimes farmers look at environmental regulations and it's a bad thing. Hmm. But he took that and he said, I'm a farmer, but this is how we can help save the environment. And enacted a lot of policies that got the bay cleaned up as well. And the bay is the healthiest it's been in hundreds of years maybe a hundred years. Wow. And it was a result of 
it's it's a tri-state area, but it was a result of a lot of the policies that Pennsylvania implemented. Hmm. So there's just a lot of good that impact people's everyday lives that you don't think about in the average day-to-day political rough and tumble, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So you took away a lot of influence from your grandfather, you know, built off of that influence in high school. Where do you go from there? Uh, so in high school, I... I kept the interest alive. So Chris and I, it was just a mock election to become the student body president. And then later I did run for class president, which now that just takes the form of organizing reunions. And I haven't been great at that. (laughs) Uh, I'm stuck in the middle of that right now too. I was vice president and we have our class reunion in two weeks. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think I had seven or eight people show up to my five year reunion. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, But then I took that, and I ended up studying politics and economics in college. I was interested in international relations, economic development, microfinance, and things like that, which we can get into later because I had a job in that for a while. Um, but you know, I took those interests, so I ended up studying international relations and economics. And I got to experience some pretty amazing things in college. I went to Messiah, which is fairly local, local to here, about as local as it gets in the Harrisburg area. And um, I got to get involved with things like our economic development group that was doing financial literacy training to people in Zimbabwe and Uganda. Mm. And I got to get involved with our, min- our campus ministry that did work in Harrisburg. And so I got to teach ESL classes and things like that to people that just needed a leg up in Harrisburg. And so it just... Messiah was very good at A, the politics department was good at teaching me how to think rather than what to think. And then B, um, it taught me how I can be compassionate and connected to my neighbors in a way that I didn't really realize in high school. And this is not an ad for Messiah College, I promise, but it was, it was a good school and it really opened up my horizons. Something that you said in passing that might kind of be like a mantra but really stuck out to me right there is that Messiah taught you how to think, not what to think. Yeah. What's that mean to you? So it was a lot on critical thinking. So every once in a while, we had professors that would make their biases known. But I had one professor, for example, that he would make us write papers and then present them and present our beliefs and how, if D is our conclusion, how A, B, and C led us there. And we had to defend each one of those premises on how we got to that conclusion. And, th- and one of the classes he taught was ethnic and racial politics in America, which is obviously one of the most contentious things we're discussing, even right now, especially just as we had 4th of July and with the flag and everything mm-hmm. like that. So then we had to, and I remember I had to present on the paper, should the Washington Redskins change their name? And, it, you know, and I had my conclusion, and it turned out that my professor disagreed with me. And I had to really defend basically in public in front of all my classmates why I believed what I did and I think that's so important and a lot of people don't do that or they're not willing to do that they believe something because it's what they've always believed or Mm. what their parents do or something like that and that's a pretty unwise way to live in my opinion yeah absolutely so also during college you had an internship is that right with John Boehner I did okay because I remember seeing this on your Instagram or something like that and I was like There's no way. How did he land that? Yeah. um, It was luck. A lot of politics, which I'll even, (laughs) I can go into with my job now too, is just being in the right place at the right time for the right purpose. Mm -hmm. And I had interned for a representative named Joe Pitts at a Lancaster area, which is where my family is originally from. You guys are bringing in Juniata County imposter on the podcast. (laughs) Um, But uh had interned for him and it just turned out that the next summer I wanted to stay in that political realm and and work something to do with politics in Washington I always wanted to go to Washington and just see what it was like explore it for a few years and I applied the next summer for all these leadership positions um so I applied to Speaker Boehner's office I applied to Kevin McCarthy's office who is still in leadership in Congress today Mm. I applied to Kathy McMorris Rogers' office, who is still in Congress now, um, and Eric Cantor's office, who actually lost that summer. He was the majority leader at the time. And 
I hadn't heard back from any of them. And so it was getting close to the, to the summer, and I, I secured another internship in Washington, which I ended up doing for half the summer, and it was pretty cool. Um, what but was I, that one? It was, it was with a think tank. They do, politi- they do policy research and recommend it to members of Congress or legislators. Okay. Um, it was very cool. And my favorite thing about that internship was they gave us free lunch every day, <laughs> uh, which in Washington, D.C. is a big deal. Everything's expensive yeah. down there. Oh, yeah. Um, and so it came time, you know, it was probably early May and I got a call and it was somebody from the speaker's office and I think they had an intern, they never told me this, but I think they had somebody that declined them for another opportunity or something like that. But they said they had an opportunity available on the floor staff. And so the speaker has many different staffs. So in any kind of politics, you have your political staff and you have your legislative staff. So, you know, you have your people that do the campaigns and things like that, and those are not funded by taxpayer dollars. But then you have your legislative staff, and you have some at home that do casework. Um, so, for example, I have three staff here that help people process claims like licensing, whether that's a medical or dental license or something, or whether it's your driver's license. They help people file tax returns. They help people get tax rebates if they're eligible. They help people sign up for public assistance if they're eligible. Things like that. So it's basically a social service office. Okay. Yeah. And then they have their staff, their legislative staff that help work on legislation. I only have, you know, in Harrisburg that's all committee driven. But in Washington, each legislator has three or four staff that do legislative work. The speaker had probably a dozen. <laughs> and... And then because of his position, the Speaker of the House actually had floor staff. And, um, and you know, these are basically people that advise other members of Congress on what's going on on the House floor that day. And there were two or three people at the time in that office when I was there in a place called the Cloakroom, which is basically an antechamber off the floor, off the House floor where they debate and things like that, where really you hear about the smoke-filled rooms in politics, and that's kind of what it is. And in John Boehner's day, he actually smoked, so it really was a smoke filled room. <laughs> um, but uh, but I had an internship where I was advising members on floor procedure and policy, and telling them what was going on that day, and also a lot of running a lot of errands for them back to their offices and things like that. But it gave me a bird's eye view of what the real nuts and bolts of politics looks like. There was negotiations that I got to hear that were going on. We were doing the budget at that time, so I got to hear a lot of that stuff. And then in the middle of that, it was when Eric Cantor, the majority leader, actually lost his primary election to another Republican. And so then it was, you know, all of a sudden people were jockeying for leadership positions Mm. and they were sitting next to me in a chair. And it was another member of Congress calling other members of Congress on the phone. Um, And, you know, this all resulted in Steve Scalise being the whip, uh, which was the member that was shot in the baseball practice a few years ago. Um, But it was... It was just incredible. I mean, I was coming face to face with these members of Congress every day. They're the people that are making the decisions for our nation. And I got to see that. So it was a lot of fun. And it's what made me decide to go to D.C. ultimately after graduation. So it was was very neat. And I was able to use some of those connections to help me get a job later. And just a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience that I'll probably never have again. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Before we jump ahead to you going to D.C. after college, something I wanted to bring up was the coffee company you got involved with. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I didn't go to college right away, or D.C. right away after college. Um, I actually ended up working for a microfinancing group that I got connected with through Messiah. Um, and I was just doing United States-based fundraising for them. But they... At the time, they're actually a lot bigger now in doing, and they've branched out quite a bit. But at the time, they were working with farmers that typically only had one to three acres in Uganda, and they were some of they were subsistence farmers. So it's what you hear about people in Uganda or um, in other areas in sub-Saharan Africa making a dollar a day. A lot of these people were living that reality, Hmm. and we were giving them one hundred to two hundred fifty dollar loans. They were using that money to invest in their communities hire workers and things like that you know I got to work with one guy that bought some chickens and then sold the chickens to his neighbors and then was able to reinvest that money and now this guy hires three or four people on his staff and is working to make his community a better place and so I was doing that and I was 
trying to figure out ways that I could raise more money for this microfinancing group. And me and our founder, his name's Andy, still a good friend of mine, came up with the idea to start selling subscription coffee to people as a way to raise money for the enterprise. So we worked with a roaster in Lancaster and started uh, started roasting coffee and selling it on a subscription basis. So like what you do with Amazon, you get coffee to your doorstep. And got my brother involved, so uh, Tyler got to help me with that. And we ended up submitting it in a business plan competition, which he later did in another year with a different business. Um, and we ended up, you know, this resulted, and the idea was that we would use this money not just for the microfinancing group's operations, but we'd use it for cash crops. So we were going to invest this in coffee farmers, for example, because coffee in Uganda is a place where farmers can make a lot of money. And, you know, then they can employ people, they can buy more acreage and things like that. So we wanted these people to transition from subsistence to commercial farming because it's a lot easier for a coffee farmer to make a lot of money and then use that to buy food rather than growing your own food. Mm, yeah. And so we tried to transition them over to that and actually resulted in some grants of substantial thousands of dollars to Ugandan coffee cooperatives. So it was pretty incredible. And I love being a part of that. Um, and I kind of, I was kind of naturally displaced in that job because my boss was actually coming back from, from grad school and I was just kind of filling in his place for a year while he was in grad school. But I would do it all over again if I could. And I still love the organization and support them and everything. Are there any remnants of this coffee company still around? Yeah, you can still go, I'll advertise for a second, but you can still go on BantuCoffee.com, B-A-N-T-U, which is East African language for just East African people. Okay. BantuCoffee.com. And you can still buy coffee. Nice. Yeah. I am no longer involved in the day-to-day -day management it's so much that my name is even spelled wrong on the website. Oh, really? But I, <laughs> I am, you know, I still buy the coffee from time to time and gives it as gifts to people and things like that. Yeah. So you can still buy it. Very cool. Yeah. And the nonprofit was called Hinga. It was H I I N G A, which is Bantu language for to cultivate. So it's pretty cool. Even though they do a lot more than just farming now, they work with in, a lot in the education space as well. So when was this? When this was when you were still in college? Uh, it was at the end of college and then my first year out of college that okay. I did this. Yep. And I lived in Harrisburg for that year. Gotcha. Okay. So then what happens after after that? Where do you go from there? So like I said, I was getting naturally displaced. Mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out what to do. And <laughs> the political bug had always kind of bit me. And I wanted to, f and I really enjoyed my experiences in D.C. So I wanted to look down there. And I can get away, I can get into why I left DC a little bit later, but I wanted to go down there and work and just kind of test myself and see what it was about. And so I went and I ended up getting an internship with a congressman from California for a few months and just kind of processing his mail and things like that. And then eventually a congressman from Allentown, uh, his name is Charlie Dent, had an opening on his staff. And when you move to Washington, for any listeners that might want to do that someday, you kind of want to get an opportunity in your home state. That's the best place to start. Okay. You can be an advisor to a president someday. You can be an advisor to the Speaker of the House, scheduler for a president, something like that. But you typically always start with someone from your home state. And Congressman Dent had a job available and took me on his staff as a staff assistant. So it was basically a paid intern. I was still sorting mail, scheduling capital tours for constituents that were visiting scheduling other tours with other agencies, White House, FBI, uh, managing his schedule. But I wasn't doing the scheduling. I was just receiving people in the office and things like that. So it was really a gatekeeper for the rest of the office, not even necessarily the congressman. Mm. But it was a start, and I was late, later able to transfer that into a legislative role working for the same congressman. So you go from that to doing the mail, but you're not just organizing the mail. You're writing mail, so you're writing responses on his behalf. So that you get to learn a lot about a lot about policy that way, and then in Washington you typically choose a path if you're working for a congressman. You either go into the communications route and you're you become a mouthpiece for someone, or you go the legislative route. And like I've already mentioned, I really enjoyed the way that policy can affect people's everyday lives, and so I wanted to go the policy route because I you can tweak things here and there, and I actually got to work on some really cool dairy insurance programs for our farmers, some crop insurance. We got some funding for the state of Pennsylvania for to combat the spotted lanternfly and some other invasive pests. 
So there was a lot of nuts and bolts things that I was able to do that I believe, A, transitioned me well into my role now, and B, really affected people's lives, not only in from Allentown to Dauphin County, where his district was, Lebanon areas, but also in the nation as a whole. So it was really neat. And I was only in that staff assistant role for a couple months before I got promoted. D.C. is a very transient city. Mm. People that are, live there aren't usually from there, and people move around a lot quickly, too. I think only two out of ten people that I was even working with down there are still in Washington. So I was able to transition that into a legislative role and just gain a lot of background and a lot of knowledge that I believe helps me today. So up until this point, it seems like you've had a ton of like awesome opportunities throughout your undergrad and the year or two beyond. What do you think you've done differently than a lot of other people that are trying to get their foot in the door in DC or in politics in general? Um, Because you're a guy from a small town and, you know, it's kind of hard for some things for for people to get to these sort of opportunities from an area like Juniata County or, um, you know, like a small town area. Um, What do you think you did differently that put you in the position to be able to land these internships, these jobs and ultimately where you're at now? Well, uh, this will be a little bit of a broken record here, but I'm going to paraphrase what a previous guest of yours has said. (laughs) Um, But when you guys have... Dylan, when you guys had Dylan Kleckel in the Marine, um, and I will do a quick plug for Cuba Mills and Arch Rock area of Juniata <laughs> County, because Shout Dylan out. was my neighbor growing up. <laughs> um, and so, like I said, there's there's something in the water there that makes us great. Um, but And we're, we're all very, very proud of him. But he, just to paraphrase him, he said something along the lines of, he felt like before he went into the Marines, he was sitting around and waiting for life to happen to him. Loved his job loved working for his family's business but he felt like there was something more out there that he could take control of himself and there's this line that teddy roosevelt has that i kind of use as my mantra and i'm gonna get it wrong but it's something like get action in your everyday life don't sit around and wait for things to happen to you Um, don't fritter away your time but get action and the idea that you can have plenty of i you can have plenty of ideas about the way things work and you hear about hacks and things like that to get ahead all the time but really you're never going to figure out how things work unless you do them yourself and that's kind of what i adopted as my own mantra um, and i will have to look up that quote because i forget <laughs> it but um, it was it's kind of i always thought that these things were interesting and i wanted to pursue them whether it was the microfinancing and the coffee stuff or whether it was politics in general. And I, you know, there's, you guys mentioned the Jocko podcast, mm-hmm. and there's there's a line that I love that he says, I, I heard him say something along the lines of, well, people ask me every day how I get up at 4 a.m. Well, I just get up at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of what I did, is I always wanted to work in D.C., and the only way to do that was moving down there. If I thought about how I was going to pay for it, or worried about my job or something like that. It just wasn't going to happen. So you just have to do it. Yeah. And you also set yourself up for these opportunities. Like, I just know, based on knowing you, you're such a hard worker and everything that, you know, you can't just apply for an internship and hope to get it without having the background that and, and putting in the yeah. work beforehand. So I think that's another important aspect of it. Um, just yeah. that you're, you know, you're a very dedicated person and you're always... Um, you know, you're always working towards those goals you have. Well, thank you. And I, and an example of that, for we went down with Messiah one time. It was an into the city trip to help us get exposure to D.C. jobs. And I already knew some people down there, and I knew what I wanted to do in Washington. So, you know, while we were doing these site visits and things like that, I was actually walking into congressmen's office, offices where I knew people and handing them my resume and saying, you know, just in case you guys have an opening – I'm applying for a job after college. I would like to work in this realm. Here's an updated resume. I know we haven't talked for a year. And they were looking at me and they were like, what the heck? Why, why are you here? <laughs> um, but it's that kind of thing is, is you just, a lot, you know, a lot of, a lot of success is just preparation and repetition over a long period of time. And that's what I applied to my job search when I was looking for a job in Washington. Yeah, that's awesome. Something that you said, which really stuck out to me. This kind of goes hand in hand with that Roosevelt 
quote actually it's a song lyric from the front bottoms i don't know if you listen to them of at course all. I did. and uh and their song uh i think it's twin size mattress uh they say i don't or they, they say i want to be a part of the chaos i don't want to watch and, and then, then complain, complain. <laughs> i feel like People like you and just your whole family in general. I'm through with finding a way. So that's a decision that I've made. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it sticks out finding to me. blame. Yeah, right. <laughs> to, you know, kind of, I guess this would be articulating it in a Christian sense, but to take up your own cross daily. I'm sure a bunch of other people have their own way of articulating that. But to, Instead of just complaining from the outside looking in, maybe not even complaining, but just saying what you would do, like to see you really walking that path, it means a lot <laughs> that, at least from the outside looking in, like you really can be the change if you just decide to do it. You decide to do right. and not decide to complain or say what you would do if you were there. Well, and that's one thing I love about my job now and what I love about your guys' podcast is that you've brought people on so far that have taken that responsibility for themselves and I'm not sure that a lot of people our age do. They're waiting for life to happen to them. They're addicted to Twitter, which I can't blame them for. I, I am too. Um, but they are they're very complacent and one thing I've learned through this job is there's a lot of people in this community that are doing a lot of really neat things and a lot of incredible things. And you guys have highlighted people that are our age that are doing that so far, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to thank you again for coming on with us. Yeah. Um, and that kind of hits on another point where you're the youngest member, right, of the house right now? I am. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and what that means to you? Yeah. There's, there's a Democrat that's about two months older than me. <laughs> and then other than that, we're the two youngest by five or six years. So... I think the average age is in the low 50s or something. So really, when I decided to run, I'll just get in, if that's okay, I'll just yeah, get in. Absolutely. Why I decided. Oh, yeah. um, so I was looking at the field. First of all, the congressman decided that he was retiring. I probably wouldn't have left that job otherwise. Um, that, well, I might have, but it was, the, it was just a really incredible opportunity. I was going to law school at night down there as well. Mm. Um, but I always wanted to take my skills and return home at some point. So I was focusing on, in law school, or I was planning to focus on, I was still in the beginning, but I was planning to focus on you know, trying to help people get ahead in our rural community. So a lot of landlord-tenant type stuff and properties and things like that, where I could really be kind of a jack-of-all-trades back here in Juniata County and help people navigate the legal system in a way that most people can't do. That's what I wanted to do eventually. And so, but I was working for the congressman and going to law school at night. And I was, so I was focusing my stuff on that. I was doing a lot of nutrition work and a lot of welfare type stuff and a lot of ag work because that's my background and it's what I know. And I was exploring for what I would do next because the congressman announced that he was retiring. And I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but then my predecessor, Adam Harris, back here, also announced that he was retiring. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it very briefly one night, went to sleep, didn't think about it again. And then a friend back home here mentioned it to me. Well, did you ever think about running for Adam Harris' seat? And I still was registered to vote back here and everything like that, so I legally could do it. And I thought, well... Yeah, it's a good time to put what I'm learning into action. It's, I love Juniata County. I always intended to serve it some way. Four years from now, it would have been as a lawyer rather than as a politician. Um, but I, it was kind of a good opportunity to move back. And I was, I was working from eight or nine to five every day and then going from law school to six to nine every weeknight. Mm. So I was also just burned out yeah, and I was ready for something different. And... Um, you know, I, I probably had to figure something out pretty soon in terms of, you know, basically I had a full-time job. I work harder now in my full-time job, but, you know, because that was a pretty set nine to five. But I had a full-time job and I had 12 credits of school and something I had to give there. And so this opportunity came up and I always intended to try and make Juniata County, sorry, make Juniata County a better place. But I never thought it would come this soon. And people were piling into the race. 
and I already told you guys this, but I noticed that none of the people getting in looked like me in terms of, like I said, there's a lot of white males in politics, but there weren't any millennials, you know, and I've always had the idea that we have a lot of friends that have, have moved away mm-hmm. from high school. And I have the idea that this is an incredible place. We're between Harrisburg and State College and a lot of major metropolitan areas. Why aren't people settling here? And there's a billion yeah. reasons why. But and the, you know, there's a reason I went to Washington right out of college instead of moving back here immediately. But I wanted to contribute to making my community a better place. Not only that, but to contribute to creating opportunity for people that are our age. And so that's one reason. And then I also looked at politics today, and it's happening on both sides, so I'm not going to throw any blame here. But it's just so negative. Everything is negative. And so I thought that if I can win this with a positive campaign and not lying to anybody, not pretending everything is sunshine and roses, because Pennsylvania has a lot of problems, but running a positive campaign, attacking people's ideas rather than the person underlying them, never saying anything negative about people's supporters or certainly I had my opinions about some of my opponents, but never saying anything negative about them publicly or privately. And, you know, that is the kind of politics that I wanted to see. And Which I think is a pretty rare thing in politics these days, it seems. I think that it is. Mm-hmm. And, and But it's what I wanted to happen. So I decided to go for it because who better to do what I want than me? Um, and ended up entering a nine-way race. It was a nine-way primary, Republican primary for state representative. Luckily won that. Um, and then my Democratic opponent, actually, who you guys remember is your track coach, yeah. and ended up dropping out of the race. And so I only had an independent from there, and it was pretty smooth sailing. But the nine-way race was tough because it was pretty much just trying to get attention in a sea of a lot of people. And a lot of people were saying outlandish things to get attention, but I didn't. Again, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to draw attention to myself, and that's why I was winning. I wanted to win because I was a competent, positive person that could create change for this area. So, what was the campaigning like? I know there's a lot of talk around campaigning and the money that goes into it and all of that. How can you walk us through that process? What you took just here in, you know, local Juniata County, and then maybe how that applies to the bigger scale, like nationwide, with these. Well, uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I'm- Unfortunately, money is a part of it. It always will be. And so I did have to go out and raise money, which is tough because economically I represent Juniata, Mifflin, and Franklin counties. Franklin County is pretty well off, but I have northern, very, very rural Franklin County, the Path Valley, St. Thomas areas. Mm -hmm. And then Juniata County and Mifflin County in terms of per capita income, Mifflin County is in the bottom two, and Juniata County is in the bottom half of counties in Pennsylvania as well. And so... It's tough to fundraise locally around here, um, but you still have to do it. And again, you just – how do you fundraise best? Well, you just go out and ask people for money. And unfortunately, that does translate into it. But I also think it's a good thing if you're a good fundraiser in politics because that means you have people behind you that believe in your ideas. And so luckily I found success in that area. Um, and unfortunately, that that is a part of politics. I wish it wasn't. Um, but you do, you do have to fundraise because you have to get your message out there. And all fundraising is is finding a way to have people hear your message, and that all costs money. But a lot of what campaigning was for me, because you, weren't, you aren't going to stand out by raising money because everybody can do that. There were, you know, as a, as a 24 at the time year old running for office, every, almost everybody in the race had more money than I did personally. So I also just went out and knocked on doors which is something you can do at the local level that you can't do if you're running for Congress. For example, Fred Keller that just got elected as our congressman, he can't go out and knock on doors because he represents 13, 14 counties. So that's a lot about the media access, getting in newspapers, getting on television, things like that. Whereas a race like this where I'm representing all of one county and part of two counties, going out and talking to voters in Lewistown and knocking on doors for five hours in one day, six hours, gets you a lot farther than a radio commercial ever could. And that way you can sit down with people, you can hear their concerns, and talk about your vision as well. 
Absolutely. So that's that's what it looked like for me. I knocked on over ten thousand doors during the prime. Uh, about seven thousand during the primary, and then another three thousand later. What kind of team did you have with you? Was it mostly family or friends, or did you hire some people? So in a nine-way primary, that's another thing that was tough. Is that there were a lot of people out there that would say, "Yeah, I'll vote for you," but I also know X, Y, and Z who are in this race running against you as yeah. well, and so I can't get out there publicly and support you, mm. especially with fundraising. That made fundraising tough because. Out of the nine candidates, there were six from Junietta County. Mm. And I doubt there's a single person in this entire county that knew just one of us. Oh, yeah. Such a like, close-knit. Yes. Like, right. Everyone knows everything about everyone. Yeah. Yes. Six of us from from Junietta County, and three of the six were from, Junia, or from, from Manna Township. Holy cow. And so that made it tough. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I didn't end up hiring anybody. Um, I think think there was one campaign that was able to hire an outside firm or something like that to help with mail and things like that but really it was my family and uh i ended up getting a thousand petition signatures for example you need 300 to get on the ballot okay but i actually used that to political ends later because right before the election i wrote them all a thank you note for endorsing me and it took hours to get that done but i uh i Ended up getting a thousand petition petition signatures to get on the ballot, and I couldn't have done that without my family going to various towns and just knocking on doors for me, and especially during that petition time, just to try and get a leg up on my competition. I couldn't have done it without my family, close friends, uh, my girlfriend and her family helped a lot. I wasn't dating her at the time, but I am now, <laughs> and uh, there were a few other people. My church really helped. Um, there were a lot of people from my church that came out, knocked on doors for me. If they knew a community that I didn't, they would go with me or go knock on doors on my behalf. And when I say I personally knocked on 10,000 doors, that did happen. But there was a lot of people that did hundreds for me otherwise mm. that helped a lot too. Especially in that preliminary phase when we were just trying to get my name out there in general. How long is this total process of campaigning? Uh, it is 11 months. Okay. So the petitions start in January, which stinks when you think about that i have to run for every two years so in about five months i just got elected but in about five months i'll be circulating petitions to run again <laughs> okay and the primary happens in april or may i think next year it's in april but because it's a presidential year but usually it happens in may and then the general elections in november okay gotcha so it's about 11 months it's a grueling process yeah this might seem like a silly question but for someone that's not very politically educated, when you go and knock on a door for a first time and you're talking to someone you've never met and you have just a couple minutes of their time to say what you're all about and your whole political platform summarized in just a few minutes, what do you say? Well, like, how do you, you know, wrap yeah. everything up? Well, that's actually another thing is that is another reason I ran is I wanted somebody to be young. I wanted somebody that would run a positive campaign and always keep it positive. But also... I think that something that is missing in our political discourse is just people are always going after the sound bites and the who can have the best zinger at the debate because they only get to talk for a minute and things like that. You know, with 21 candidates in that Democratic primary, that's what's going on right now. But what a lot of people think is missing from the political system is someone that will just lend a listening ear. So I would knock on a door and say, hey, I'm knocking on doors today. I just wanted to get my name out there. I wanted to introduce myself. I'm John Hershey. And I'm running for your state representative seat. And if you'd be willing to consider me in a couple months or in a couple days, I would really love your vote. But what are you looking for in Harrisburg? And then I would just allow that person to talk. Okay. And around here, it's people want to keep their guns. Um, <laughs> a lot of people are pro-life and they're really concerned about property taxes. 70% of doors, those were the issues. And, but I would just allow them to speak. And that, A, allowed me to get a good framework going into this job of what people are looking for around here. And B, it just felt, it gave people the ability to feel like they have a voice in Harrisburg because they were talking to their potential representative, now representative, and telling him what they wanted. And I think that's missing from a lot of our political discourse where people are going to you and telling you what they believe, but you're always wondering if they're listening on the other end. So now what do you do if, if you know, the the majority of people have some sort of viewpoint that doesn't really line up with yours? Um, so, I don't know, say, if we go to the gun thing, say you were um, 
pro gun and everyone actually was like anti like they wanted to ban guns what would you yeah. do in that situation and that happened a bunch of times so the property tax one is very controversial for example because people around here hate property taxes because they own a lot of land but property taxes fund our schools so it's it's a really delicate balance and I ran into plenty of people during the campaign that don't agree with me and I what I would tell them was I only promise to do two things in this campaign. I plan to work hard for you in Harrisburg and represent everybody to the best of my ability. And I promise to always listen. That doesn't mean I'll always agree with you, but I will listen to what you have to say and why you believe what you do. And I even have meetings coming up in my office this week about people that disagree with votes I took in Harrisburg. But I'm willing to hear them out. Yeah. And okay. and I also promised that I would always be able to explain why I took a vote that I did in Harrisburg. You know, so it's just not just top down party driven, but I would give you reasons for doing what I did. Okay. That kind of speaks to not being part of the negativity a lot of people think of when they just think of state and uh, you know federal politicians. Yeah. You're so willing to hear people out, and at least for me, when I start to look at politics and I am trying to become more politically educated, I get frustrated with you know, the political gridlock, whether it's at the state or the federal level, because it seems like people on each side, so both the right and the left, are looking through their political lens, and when they see, for example, a bill coming up without even knowing the substance of the bill, it seems they're so quick to want to shoot down the opposing party. Or even just people in normal conversation like this, if I was a Democrat and you are a Republican, and I would, you know, be much more likely to not hear you out and shoot your thoughts down without hearing you out and just having a good discussion and teach, you know, why do I think this way? And assessing what the actual truth is. I really like that you are hearing people out like that because I think it moves closer to pursuing the truth in each and every situation and not looking through the lens of your political agenda and shooting down anyone else you know opposes you yeah and i i try to always critically think about the votes i take again learning how and why i think something rather than just doing it is rather than just voting for it is important um so that's something i wanted to take into office as well what do you think about the party lines do you think they're necessary to have these two like huge parties that see things so differently like would it be would it make more sense to have just like you know go based on ideas not necessarily strictly these parties i don't know what i'm trying to say but like that's a great question yeah. so i believe that i wish we didn't have a two-party system as mm -hmm. if that's what you're asking yeah basically uh you know because there are so many there's so much diversity of thought in america in pennsylvania and even in juniata mifflin and franklin counties that you can't always encompass that in a two-party system and we saw that when Hillary ran against Donald, and people despised both of them, but they mm -hmm. felt like they didn't have an option otherwise. Yeah, so absolutely. it was pick the lesser of two evils. But at the same time, I've always been, I have always preached the gospel of work with what you have, and I don't think we'll ever see a change or a deviation from that, just because they're so entrenched in the way we think. Mm -hmm. These two parties have been forever, around forever. And there are certain things that can happen. You know, there used to be a Whig party, and there no longer is. Um, and you know they were kind of founded as an anti-slavery party, and then the Republicans co-opted those values. And Abraham Lincoln, if he was elected twenty years beforehand, might have been a Whig, but he was later a Republican. Mm -hmm. And you know the Republicans have certainly adopted a lot of libertarian values. Democrats have adopted a lot of Green Party values and things like that. But in working with what you have, realizing that you can work to change this two-party system. And I believe that's a worthwhile goal. But I can also work where I am today and work to make the Republican Party more of an image in what I would like to see it be. So, you know, if I want to see it be more inclusive and more uh, critical thinking or anything like that, the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to join the party and act like that in meetings that you go to. You know, just act the way you would want to be in local party meetings, when I'm in committee meetings in Harrisburg, and things like that. So what are some of your big goals as uh, a Republican representative? Uh, what are some of the things you'd like to do? Uh, well, again, I think a lot of issues aren't Republican or Democrat. 
and I was elected to represent 65,000 people that mm-hmm. all believe totally different things. But I think something does need to be done about the property tax system while keeping our school funding intact. I was a public school kid just like you guys were, so that's very important to me. Um, but at the same time, we have a lot of large landholders in Junietta and Mifflin counties that are able to unable to afford their bill going up on, over time, and it's kind of re- a regressive tax on large landholders and older people that are no longer in earning income, but they have this land. And so switch it over to a fairer, more consumption-based system or, or income-based system that I think would be a lot more equitable to our state and switching the school funding that way. A lot of people, even rural people, don't like that because that would put a lot of mo- the money in Harrisburg rather than keeping it locally. But I think it's important that we have to address that. Um, and otherwise, I also like guns as a rural Republican <laughs> representative. Um, but then also just... Again, being the best representative that I can be. I don't. I didn't really go into this job with any overarching policy principles that I had to push, other than basically guns, life, and property taxes elimination. But I, I you know, there's plenty of other legislators that are doing that work in Harrisburg that I can team up with, and I really am just taking my first couple years here and learning about what I want my career in Harrisburg to look like. Awesome. Just out of curiosity, you talk about those big three. You're kind of responsible for pushing guns, pro-life, property taxes. Is there any sort of views that you hold closely to you that maybe you aren't intimately connected with representing this population, but any sort of views that are, you know, might fall outside of the realm of the quote-unquote tr- traditional Republican or conservative views that, you know... I guess would defy, if you will, that that two party agenda. Yeah. And, like, what sort of views do you hold that might not fall under that traditional conservative ideology? Yeah. Well, I think there are a few areas that you can talk about, and I think mostly I am a product of Juniata County, so I am conservative. Uh, that's what I like. But there's a few ways that I think the parties can work together to achieve a lot of real problems. Uh, to achieve solving a lot of real problems. For example, both parties are agreeing right now that the immigration system in America is a problem. Um, you know, there's very few loud vocal minorities that say we don't want immigrants, but a lot of people are saying, Republicans and Democrats are saying that we need to fix the immigration system. We need to find out a way for people to legally get here. And we need to transition them to citizenship and help them become productive members of society, etc. They disagree on the means, but they do agree on the ends. And I think coming at this from just like you did a couple minutes ago, I, hopefully it's all right to bring my faith into this, but mm-hmm. I look th- at things, a lot of things through a faith lens. And I think that Republicans could do a lot better. And there are Republicans that talk about this a lot. Actually, George W. Bush did. But do a lot better at being compassionate about people that are different from us. So, you know, just as the Statue of Liberty says, give me your tired, your poor, we need to look out for those people in our society. And so things that have been very important to me in Harrisburg that might not be important to the average Republican, although I can find a lot of colleagues that agree with me, it's not so partisan at the state level as it is in national politics, but are looking out for... um, people like immigrants or the, the mentally ill or addicted people and trying to help them get a leg up is something that you probably hear a lot more about in democratic circles than Republican circles. Mm-hmm. And when I went to Harrisburg, I actually asked to be on the human services and health committees because health deals with a lot of welfare and nutrition policy and things like that. And human services deals with addiction and they deal with the human services code, which is a lot of welfare code. Not to eliminate those things, which a lot of Republicans might want to do, but to actually ensure that we're spending taxpayer dollars effectively to help what Jesus might have called in the Bible the least of these. And that is somewhere where I probably differ from normal Republican orthodoxy. But again, there are a lot of Republicans in Washington and in Harrisburg that I think are willing to come along with that idea. And just making the party more inclusive in general. So I think the party can be, you know, Paul Ryan always used to use the term the party of opportunity. I think it can be the party of opportunity for everybody rather than 
the party of opportunity for a select few people that look and sound like me. Right. Mm-hmm. Do you think that you being a millennial and being young, that that helps uh, with being able to broaden the horizons of the Republican Party? I do, yeah, because if you look at millennials, most of them don't vote for Republicans. Mm-hmm. I would hope that in Juniata County they do, because that helps me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it does change my perspective a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, and I've, I've been fortunate to travel a lot, and Messiah College preaches compassion a lot and things like that. So I have a lot of things that have led me here, and I talked about my church briefly earlier. They do a amazing job of meeting people's material needs in the community. They meet a lot of spiritual and physical needs and they just look out for a lot of people that are down and out and I think that train trained me a lot in what I believe today as well and certainly being a millennial helps you know I might be might be a little bit more lenient on some social issues and things like that that maybe my older colleagues aren't Mm -hmm. and now you recently introduced the bill is that right uh so I actually have seven or eight bills that I've introduced yeah thank you in Uh, that new uh agricultural package that yeah, that so that was actually signed into law by the governor. So not only did I introduce it, but I got my colleagues to pass it out of ag committee. Then I got them to pass it in the full house. And then I got the Senate to pass it, and the governor signed it. Wow. So I actually I have two bills already that have been signed into law, which I'm very excited about. Uh, one connects, one helps connect farmers with schools. So it's a farm-to-school bill, but it helps them connect with the kids with healthy eating and things that are being grown right there in their community, teaching them where their food comes from. So it not only gets local produce into the schools, but it would also provide grants to get the kids on the farms for field trips mm. and things like that. Most people have no clue where their food comes from. That sounds like a great idea to yeah. me. Yeah. yeah, you hear from kids in Harrisburg, and a lot of them might think that literally milk just comes falls from the sky or something mm. like that. and they, <laughs> You get it from the grocery store, and that's where it comes from. And I think that can kind of somewhat tackle the bigger problem at hand with like nutrition in the United States or at least like in areas like these um, I wouldn't say we're in a food desert or anything like that but there are areas where there's places in the US where people can only get these certain processed foods or things like that yeah. but when we have farms right right here on our back door um, you know why not use those and get it into the schools yeah and actually certain uh, that's that's part of what it is is to help combat hunger make sure our kids are eating healthy foods rather than than Cheetos and chips and yeah. soda. And actually, parts of Juniata County are considered a food, food desert by the USDA. Oh, uh, wow. Parts of southern Juniata County, even south of us yet, where it starts to get real rural. Hmm. Um, and then my other bill, actually, I'm on the Judiciary Committee that considers a lot of civil and criminal legal issues, just because of my brief legal training, even though I'm not a lawyer. And we, I recently got a bill passed to allow victims of a crime to be in the courtroom. So currently it's up to a judge whether the victim should be excluded from a criminal trial or not. And it allows them, it gives the victim the right to be in the courtroom if they choose to be, to face their abuser or the accused, whoever that might be, and hopefully give them a sense of closure. Because again, I think that public policy should be looking out for people that are down and out. And a lot of times crime victims, sexual abuse victims, they are down and out. And so my other bill gives them the right to be in the courtroom Whereas before it was up to a judge, and that was just signed into law by the governor as well. Wow. Why it's, was it up to a judge before? And that seems. I think it's something that was just never defined. Okay. And so over hundreds of years, Pennsylvania common law just kind of evolved that way. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's a good issue to tackle too. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> so, so it's very cool. And I've had a lot of people do ask me that. They're like, "Well, wasn't that the victim's choice before?" And it wasn't. We actually had a case in Pennsylvania about ten years ago where a judge kicked a victim out of a courtroom. Wow. And and they didn't get to face that the person that they were accusing of a crime, hmm. and so it allows them to kind of have that closure that they might not have had before. And that's one thing I love about my job is it's not all ag. You know, we have ag is our number one industry in Pennsylvania. It's the number one industry in the eighty second district. But we also have a ton of small business here. We have a ton of manufacturing here. Hmm. Number manufacturing is probably our second biggest employer behind ag and you get to learn about a lot of incredible issues through the committees I'm on in Harrisburg so it's a lot of fun so what about go ahead sorry so you said you have about seven bills that you have introduced is that right yes so what about what are in these other ones if you're allowed to talk about it yeah so some are related to 
ag issues, so some environmental regulations and things like that. I won't get too much into detail sure. uh, okay. just because it, I think it bores the average person. <laughs> but uh, environmental, environmental regulations, some transportation regulations for our farmers trying to overturn those. So I have one bill related to how wide ag equipment can be on the road, because mm. transportation issues, a lot. Like I said, a lot of these, a lot of people don't consider that political issues like this affect their everyday life. Any state road that you travel on, I live along thirty five, affect you know that that is that is officially under the state's jurisdiction. So allowing equipment with certain weight to be on the road, uh, allowing kids to drive their tractors to school for ag mechanics classes and things like that allowing that type of activity. Um, and then I have a few related to local government jurisdiction issues. So, for example, it is actually municipal governments are allowed to outlaw lemonade stands if they would like for little kids. Mm-hmm. So I have a bill that would allow minor businesses to operate if they earn less than $10,000 a year. <laughs> you know, just so, so, certain types of small freedom things that I think are important to you know growing up and living a fun childhood but sometimes municipal governments are clamped down on that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, I have a couple that are cleaning up the books in Pennsylvania. We have certain laws that have been on the books for hundreds of years. So, for example, I was on the tennis team in high school. It's actually illegal to play tennis in Pennsylvania before <laughs> 1 p.m. on a Sunday. So I have a law. I have a bill that re- would repeal that law. So a lot of certain little things like that um, that they kind of find and suggest them to you, and it's kind of your test for a lot bigger policy lifts down the road. So a few of them were my ideas. A few of them were people from around here ideas, but it's a lot of fun so far. I bet there's a ton of crazy little laws like that, like can't play tennis before 1 a.m. Yes, it's also illegal to play water polo before 1 p.m. on Sunday. Or 1 p.m., sorry. Yeah, Yeah, right, right. (laughs) How do you even find those seemingly ridiculous, like old legislature to uplift? Yeah, it's a lot of research that goes into it. And I can't take credit for it all. We have incredible staff in Harrisburg that works on a lot of this stuff. Do you think you'll ever go back to law school? I, th- I think about it a lot. Um, I do not need legal training to do the job that I have now. Okay. Because while a lot of it is legislative, we do have counsel in Harrisburg that work for different committees that are actually writing our bills for us. So we have the idea for the bill. We want this to get done. And we tweak certain things to know what they look like. But they're the ones that actually write it to get it in synthesis with current law, to make it constitutional, all that kind of stuff. And... I would never be doing that myself in the job that I have now. So I don't need law school to do what I'm doing. Um, so I think if I went back to law school, it would have to fit into my overall goals of what I want to do. Okay. Um, and while law school absolutely informed what I do now, especially because I sit on the Judiciary Committee and we talk about criminal and civil laws and things that I've learned in the classroom all the time, um, I don't need it for the job that I have now. And the le- so I don't need it for the legislative job. And then the other half of my job is, again, helping people with different problems that they have with state agencies. So with with social services or licensure issues or tax issues, things like that, helping small business with permits, helping people with building permits, things like that. A lot of that stuff, you don't need a law degree either. It's just It's just a matter of making the right connection for someone. And so... I have not decided yet. It has to fit into my overall goal of what I want to see. And really the only option I have is to go to Widener at night, um, which is doable. But I also loved George Mason and, and didn't want to give that up. So I am not sure. You know, I have a little bit of pride there too. So this is kind of a tangent, but what's the process like applying to law school? And how do you go about that and do it successfully like you did? Yeah, so you, you take the LSATs which are, is the law school admission test. And it's a lot of, you can train for that test. So it's your raw score that you take, that you get on the first time might be a good indicator of how well you'll do in law school, but it has nothing to do with law school in general. And everything you do in law school, you can train for. So it's a lot of logic games, logical reasoning, reading comprehension. That's what the LSAT is. And... Like I said, my raw score, the first time I ever took the test was probably in the bottom 50% of test takers. But by the time I was done, I was in the top 20% of test takers. It's something you can train for over time. You just have to build on it over time. And it's a lot of repetition, a lot of retaking these logic games so you know what they look like. 
and then you apply. So you you don't have to have any kind of political background or anything like that. Uh, a lot of English majors in my law school class, a couple econ majors, and actually in at George Mason where I was at, uh, they actually have a huge. They're very popular in IT law. So there were a lot of people with tech backgrounds that were in my class. A lot of people with bio- biology backgrounds that they wanted to do things with pharmaceuticals and ph- pharmaceutical IP, it, which is intellectual property. So it's patents and things like that. So people with huge diversities get into law school. And so you don't have to have the political policy background, even though I did. So what kind of advice would you have for somebody that's wanting to go to law school? Um, where should they focus their efforts? Should they put it toward the LSAT, do you think? Or is is it something that you need to have a pretty well-rounded profile to be able to apply? Be well-rounded. So approach it like you try to get into an Ivy League school or something like that. Participate in everything that you can and everything that you reasonably can that you think are the direction you want to go. Because again, there are so many different types of law that, you know, I just talked to a firearms lawyer recently about Second Amendment issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were people in my class that were doing biology. There were people doing taxes. There were people doing ITIP, so tech intellectual property. And there are just so many different ways you can do. So just try to get as well-rounded as you can. And then probably 50% of law school admissions is your LSAT score. Okay. So that's what they decide for admission, and that's also the level of support you get as well. So that's actually why I went, ended up going to George Mason as a pl- as opposed to some place like Georgetown because they offered me so much uh, so much financial aid that I couldn't really turn it down, and it was all based on my LSAT score. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Cool. So we got on the law school talk because you were talking about the possibility of yeah. may or may not return to, to law school. Any other possibilities? That like big goals, career wise. I, I haven't figured it out yet. So in my job now, I'm making laws that affect people's everyday lives, and I'm also getting them connected to state agencies and solving problems on an everyday basis. And no single day in the legislature looks the same, and I think that's really fun. And my favorite part of the job is that I'm getting to meet people from all walks of life in the legislature. Everybody has a different background, but also here at home, there's a lot of cool people in this community that are working to make our community a better place that I would have never met if I hadn't run for office. And I think that's incredible. So as of right now, no, I wanna do well where I'm at. I won't rule anything out in the future, but I really like my job and wanna do well here. And you know, I'm not gonna do the classic politician denial, I'll never run for higher office. <laughs> if the opportunity's right, I will, because I do feel like this is what I'm created for and like mm-hmm. I'm good at my job. But at the same time, I wanna do well where I'm at there's a lot of things that can be changed. I had a professor actually ask me when I told him I wanted to go to Washington and work. He said, well, why don't you go to Harrisburg? You can make difference a lot faster. Mm. There's so much less staff. The government's smaller. You can move up a lot faster in Harrisburg. And you know, when the federal government's deciding a lot of macro things, like should we go to war? Should we send more troops to XYZ? Should we spend more money for this base? Should we spend more money on this welfare program? There's a lot of nuts and bolts things that your state and local governments are doing that actually affect your life on an everyday basis. Mm -hmm. And you see this perception sometimes on social media and things like that. But I never really knew that it was that way in practice until I got to Harrisburg. And there's a lot of good I can do for our community in Harrisburg. So basically what I'm saying is I'm not in a hurry. And I I am the youngest legislator by quite a few years, other than my one colleague that's my age. Um, And so I just don't really need to be in a hurry at this point in my career. So you kind of hinted at it, and I think I already know the answer 100%. But uh, you said that re-election's every two years. Mm -hmm. So are you definitely going to run for re-election? I am running for re-election, yes. Gotcha. Uh, I have not officially kicked off my campaign. My fundraiser will be in the beginning of September. Okay. Uh, but I have started raising money for my next re-election, and I have publicly said that I'm running for re-election. I think in Harrisburg, so a lot of it, unfortunately, is not merit-based. It's seniority-based. So to be a committee chairman, for example, say you are a pro-life committee chairman and somebody of the health committee, and you have somebody introduce legislation that's pro-choice. Say it's pro-choice and... 110 members of the House support it. 
we have 203. So that's obviously a majority. And they're doing what their people want. So that might be what a majority of Pennsylvania wants. But as that pro-life committee chairman, you can totally kill the legislation without ever even taking it up for a vote. Mm. And our committee chairman and leaders in the House have a ton of power um, that is actually slightly different in, at the federal level uh, because you can file discharge petitions. You can get a certain amount of people to sign on to your legislation that you can get it out of the committee whether the person supports it or not. But in Harrisburg, you can basically, if you're the chairman of a committee, you can bring up your priorities and you can kill things that aren't your priorities. Mm-hmm. And um, there are people that wait around for 20 years just so they can be the transportation chairman mm-hmm. and enact a program that they've been dreaming of for 20 years. Um, and, you know, so I am running for re-election. I've been very successful legislatively so far. I don't brag about this in Harrisburg, but I might be the only freshman legislator that's had two bills signed into law in my first six months. Oh. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the big things that you can change come further down the road when you have a little bit of seniority, when your colleagues trust you, and when you're entrusted with higher committee position. So I am running for re-election, and I plan to for the near future as well. Is there anything you're going to do differently this time? So like the first time was you know, kind of gone and blind almost, right? Because you never run for mm-hmm. this kind of public office before. Is there anything differently with this campaign you're going to do? I mean, you were successful, so that's not... To really... be honest, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. So I'm not going to do anything differently in terms of knocking on doors, raising money. Hmm. I try to do a lot of direct voter contact. So when I spent money, it was on sending mail to people rather than in this kind of area, a TV ad is going to be a waste of money. Mm-hmm. Um, but... I will cut down on the mistakes. You know, there's things that can be fine-tuned. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel, but, you know, putting rubber on your steel tire can get a lot of traction. (laughs) So, uh, you know, there's certain things we can fine-tune and make better for this time around. Just in the way that I talk to voters, in the way that I approach fundraising, there's a lot of things that I can improve upon, but I'm not going to do anything new. No. Sounds good. (laughs) So you, you hinted towards getting bigger bills passed down the road, like ideas you've been holding on to for a long time. Anything you have in the back of your mind that you want to slowly start pushing forward that you haven't tried to introduce yet? Yeah, well, there's a lot of things that Pennsylvania does well and a lot of things that Pennsylvania does poorly. So in terms of economic stability and opportunity, for example, Pennsylvania has a credit rating that I think is 49th or 50th in in the United States behind Illinois. Uh, I mean, maybe ahead of Illinois, and that's about it. And, you know, when we're compared to Chicago, it's not usually a good thing. That's kind of the city that's known for corrupt politics, and they're always out of money and have to have the federal government bail them out and things like that. Pennsylvania is not much better. So we we are not good at putting money away, for example, for when the economy is bad and we need to make up revenues rather than cutting programs. You guys might remember this a few years ago. Um, and Governor Corbett was blamed for it. But the, in the budget, they had to cut a ton of money for education because the revenue just wasn't there to support it, what they were spending before. And that is a situation that we get ourselves in. We create that. And it's a lot of short-term thinking that we don't look long, long-term long and we don't think down the road and think that this could be a problem. We just want to spend all the money now. And there's a lot of things that Pennsylvania does like that that we've done that way for hundreds of years and why do we do it it's just the way we do things yeah and so because of that credit rating because of the credit rating our corporate income taxes um we have the highest rate in the nation so what's happening when we enact any new taxes on a business they say well we're already paying 9.99 percent corporate income tax we're going to move to north carolina or texas where the economy is better and you might think that as being too pro-business or too pro-corporation or whatever. But when you drill down on that, these are jobs that everyday people have. And these are higher wages that they'd be getting and those sorts of things. And so we need to improve the business climate in Pennsylvania. Um, and one idea, so you asked about my specific policy ideas, because mm-hmm. you can ask almost anybody in Harrisburg and they would say the same thing. Again, we just disagree on the means, but we don't disagree that this is a problem. Um, for example, uh, you know, we disagree on the means. The governor knows that we have a crumbling infrastructure in Pennsylvania, um, and he wants to fund it through an extra tax on the, on the natural gas industry. I disagree with that because they hire hundreds of people out west that are displaced by coal jobs, 
Um, and it's actually the second biggest industry in Pennsylvania right now behind ag. And we're just taxing something that's successful. And why are, why are we picking them instead of the pharmaceutical industry? Well, is it because the pharmaceutical industry might have put money into somebody's pocket? Mm-hmm. You know, you never know. And I don't think we should be singling out certain industries like that. Um, but me and the governor would both agree that Pennsylvania needs to improve our infrastructure because a lot of our bridges and roads get D and F ratings from federal rating <laughs> agencies. Um, so that, I think I saw something online. I'm not sure. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know how there's that road that's shut down by the Juniata County Library? That's correct. Was that, you were doing something with getting that fixed up, Yes. Right? So that's actually, we have Senator Corman to think for that funding. Okay. Um, but it's a $1.2 million bridge, and Governor or Senator Corman got $500,000 for it. And we are going back now and trying to get the, uh, the rest of the funding. So hopefully we'll be successful. Yeah. Uh, we have not been successful yet, so I can't promise anything. Okay. But that is part of the problem. And so businesses aren't coming here because, well, why would you move a business right by the library when you can't even use the major thoroughfare sure. to get to the library? Um, and so uh, you know, there's a lot of disagreeing over the means of how these things will happen. Um, so just to go back to the natural gas example, uh, the governor's trying to signal out this one industry. I don't think that's wise, but we both agree that we need to fix the infrastructure. Um, and we already double tax our shale industry, and I can get into that another, another time. They pay the corporate income tax. They also already pay thing, a thing that's called the impact tax. Besides the point, I'm, I'm digressing. But um, you know, we have the crumbling infrastructure. We need to create a better business climate. Pennsylvania does not save well for the quote-unquote rainy day. Um, and there's a lot of things that we could do to attract business to the area. And so you asked my, about my specific legislative ideas. Um, one thing that's very important to me is that when a business or a farm applies for a new permit, so we'll say an envir- environmental permit, that's something that farms and businesses both deal with. Um, so like a stormwater management permit, you have to basically promise that you'll spread nutrients or manage your runoff in a certain way that you're not damaging streams in the environment. And both businesses and farms have to go through these permitting processes. Well, in Pennsylvania, a farmer can lose tens of thousands of dollars because they wait they wait a year for this permit, where in Maryland, which is a state that's known for being more regulated than Pennsylvania, it'll take 90 days. Hmm. And that is, nine, that is hundreds of days of lost productivity. And so I, one thing I would really like to look at and that is important to this area is reforming the permitting process that every business and every farm has to deal with whether and every new building project. So even if you want to put an addition onto your house here, you have to get these permits. And in Pennsylvania, it's the most cumbersome process, one of the worst processes in the nation. That's something I would like to look at specifically. But anyway, like I said, though, we agree on the ends. We might disagree on the means. So it's a it's a matter of getting 102 of my colleagues to sign on to that to get a majority then getting the senate to sign on to it and then the governor sometimes a tricky process nice so kind of taking a u-turn here but before we started this podcast cole and i were talking back and forth that like man we don't really know anything about politics or what's going on and especially at the state level so what do you recommend to people like to cole and i and people like us how, do, how should we get our information? Because um, there's a lot of stuff out there that you hear about. Um, news media are very biased toward one side or the other. What do you recommend for people like us that, you know, we want the information, we want to be informed, but where do we go? Like, we're so lost, basically, especially at, at the state level, too. So you asked about why about how you guys might not be so educated on politics and how you can learn more and how people can start learning more about this kind of rule. And I noticed uh, when you guys started your podcast, it was about education, science, medicine, athletics, and some other things. And (laughs) so politics is one of those lowly other things that you guys want to talk about. Um, And I recognize that, you know, we're not popular people always, but... uh, (laughs) I, think. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily what we were driving at. Just, no, I know. Those are our it's areas. what you guys know. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I understand. And I've enjoyed your episodes so far. Um, but I am opinionated about this issue. I don't think you should start with your national news media. Um, so not to pick a side, but CNN and Fox are not the places to go for your news because... Oh, man. <laughs> right. Yeah, because you, very polarized. Yes, because... 
it's not that you only hear one side. You will hear the news, but they use language in a way that does effectually make you only hear one side. And unfortunately, about 80% of Americans get their news from these sources. And there's newspapers doing it too. So um, I'm trying to think of... Actually, the Wall Street Journal is not so bad because a, a lot of Americans trust them. But if you're reading the New York Times, for example, they, use, they just use different language. Um, so I'll go back to Fox News or CNN because I, I like printed media. But Fox and CNN, they'll tell you the same story but they'll use different words that basically mean you're only hearing one side of the issue. And I think that's bad. Um, so, again, I think you should go to a lot of primary sources. So, you know, if you hear about this blank, blank happening to someone, um, go to the person that it happened to and ask how they felt about it. Uh, I think a lot can be learned from simple human conversations. Um, I will always plug local media. I think the Sentinel, their editorials, for example, are conservative in nature, but the state and national news that they print is often Associated Press prints. And they do a good job of just telling you what's going on without telling you what to believe or anything like that. Um, and to be honest, I, I am apologist for Twitter. Um, a lot of people, I, I don't do social media really. I have a weird lurker Instagram account where I look at my friends and family. Um, and I actually, because of my public position now, I took down my, my private Facebook page. So now I only have my campaign and legislative pages. But I am a big fan of Twitter because oftentimes you can learn about a news story before it actually hits the national spin cycle and the 24 hour news cycle. Um, and you can kind of hear the unvarnished what really happened before anything else. And you hear a lot of takes on Twitter as well. Um, yeah, you open up the comments section. Yeah, you right. Just... Yeah, you might hear the story and then it might, you know, it might get ratioed, which on Twitter means it had, might have 50 favorites and 1,000 comments. But you get the raw, unvarnished what actually happened. Um, and it's either a person having a take on something or whether it's the actual news story. You know, so, I, I heard about the, for example, the Charlottesville protests where somebody died a few years ago and it, it, white nationalists and then the president made his comment that was insensitive um, I knew about the, all that happening since Twitter and I got to see it in real time I got to see what happened in Charlottesville and then the president's reaction rather than hearing um, you know Tucker Carlson defending the president on Fox or Anderson Cooper blasting him on CNN you got to see what actually happened for yourself and I got to decide for myself so I defend Twitter. I there's a lot of toxicity on Twitter that happens as well. But, but it also comes back to who do you actually follow on Twitter? Because you could still follow Fox News or CNN and get your news that way. But how do you get these more local media? Like how do you pick and choose who to follow there? Uh, so a lot of lo your local sources have a lot of good reporting. Um, so I follow the Sentinel, and then I follow a lot of Harrisburg sources. Again, Harrisburg things aren't always partisan. They sometimes are, but I follow like the local public news station. And there's a lot of reporters that are just covering the nuts and bolts of what's happening rather than offering their own take on it. Um, so I do follow a lot of Harrisburg area reporters that, you know, just by virtue of what I do and what they do, they sometimes know what's going on in the legislature before I do. For example, if something's happening in a committee hearing A, but I'm sitting in committee hearing B, and I'm not part of that debate, but then I can go to that person later and find out what happened. You can still follow the, the national news sources, but what I would suggest if you do that is to follow a mix. So for example, I think I stay away from all of those polarized ones, but in terms of the newspapers, I do follow the Wall Street Journal, I follow the New York Times, I follow Washington Post. Um, just try to get a mix of those different sources so that you're not eating a diet of the same food, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you're, you're getting a nice balanced food pyramid of news sources. I think right after this podcast, Nick and I are going to go into your following on Twitter. We're just going to destroy the follow <laughs> button. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and I have opinions about it. I don't agree with all of the people that I follow on Twitter, but it's yeah. a good way to learn what people think and what they say. Um, and again, Twitter is not always the way to go either. There's a lot of toxicity there. So if people hate it, I understand. Um, but in terms of, you know, a lot of my job is local focused rather than national focused. So, I hate the question when people ask me, what do I think of the president? 
Because A, that's going to get me in trouble no matter what I say. <laughs> um, because, you know, there are people, he's so polarizing. People either love him or they hate him. There's no in between. Um, and so that's A. And B, he actually has no bearing over the everyday part of my job. Yes, it's politics, but the issues that we decide on every day in Harrisburg, building roads, building roads and bridges, fixing welfare programs, funding education, have nothing to do with things that he's doing at the federal level. I can't comment on racial issues in Charlottesville. I can't bomb Iran, things like that. Um, and so really he had, other than changing the discourse, he might be a little bit more negative than I would like him to be. I don't have any effect on him and he does not have any effect on me. So I don't like when people ask that question. It's, it's local. And I don't know where I was going with that answer. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, so in terms of Twitter, I tr do try to get perspectives of people that are on the ground um, and living this every day. Oh, that's where I was going, is with the local thing, oh, I try to have a lot of my ideas be organically driven from the grassroots here rather than allowing the president to tell me what to think the you know or Chuck Schumer telling me what to think on the other side or anybody in Harrisburg the governor anybody like that um, so really the news does not affect how I live my life on an everyday basis and I think it makes you pretty negative and cynical if it, you do let it that happen so I actually try to stay away from a lot of that stuff even though I said I do get my news from Twitter um, and I try to let my human connections and my interactions here at home drive what I do and what I think and I think that's important. And you know, I do listen to podcasts and things like that um, because I think there's a lot of people with a lot of good ideas and perspective. But at the like, same time, who do you like to listen to as far as politics uh, with podcasts? Uh, so I actually try to be a little bit more well-rounded than politics. So I don't do a lot of political podcasts. Okay. Um, but I do listen to. There's three really good ones that I listen to in Harrisburg. Um, two are public radio. Uh, it's Katie Meyer and Scott Lamar. I think it's Smart Talk from. W WITF, NPR, local NPR mm -hmm. station, and Katie's is called State of the State. There are a lot of good nuts and bolts, what's going on in Harrisburg. Um, this is what people are thinking, etc. It's a good way to inform me for my job. And then there's another guy named Scott Broyette that does a lot of good long-form interviews with politicians on both sides of the aisle. And it is a good way for me to help find out the motivations and desires of my colleagues in the house so i really like his interviews as well um and he actually works for a a i believe it's a it's a lobbying group for better or for worse um but he he works with members of both sides of the aisle and allows them to talk about their priorities and it's a good way to learn and that one is called bruise and views i believe nice and it's really good really well designed um and then the other two that i listen to that are a more national commercialized scale i like the art of manliness podcast um because he brings Who's that with that is uh brett mckay is actually the managing editor of the website art of manliness but he brings on people with all different perspectives about you know it's it's a self-improvement podcast but he also brings on people that have just done really unique things like there's a guy that recreated the oregon trail and actually took a wagon train across the United States. Wow. He brought that guy on to interview him. And I loved that episode because it was something that I've just never heard of and it was yeah. bizarre. Um, but then he does, he brings people like Jocko on. Um, you know, he brings, uh, you know, and, and the whole pod, you know, he brings in scholars in the classics like Aristotle and Plato, things like that. And it's just a lot about how to be a better man. And that's important to me. So I enjoy that one. And I enjoy the Freakonomics podcast, um, which their tagline is the hid hidden side of everything. And that a lot of things have economic drivers. For example, your name that you were born with can have a lot of future prediction on your economic success. That's or insane. There was there was a there, there was it's everything. They did an episode of um, why mattress stores are usually on the same corner in certain towns, and they they talked about competition mm -hmm. and how that it can influence people's macro and micro decision making. Um, they did one called "How Does the President of the United States Really Matter? Does he actually influence the overall economy? And so they just try to... What was the take on that one? Yes and no. Okay. Um, but mainly no. <laughs> Cop out. Yeah, yes, yes and no, but mainly no. They kind of said, you know, he can make comments. You know, Donald Trump can make a comment about Fed interest rate making and the economy, 
you know, can go up or down in a single day. Mm-hmm. But over the long term trend, not really. The economy is going to have booms or busts, no matter who's in the White House. Um, you know, just, and that's that's a lot of the idea of people think that FDR got us out of the Great Depression with his New Deal ideas. But a lot of people say it was really the war that got us out because we got all that manufacturing up again. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they, it's the hidden side of everything, is what they call it, Freakonomics. Um, and then they try to explore. They just try to explain these really random phenomenon in economic terms that we see. And it makes economics, which is a boring science to a lot of people, even though I studied it, it makes it accessible to a lot of people, and I like that. Absolutely. So three local ones, and then Freakonomics and Art of Manliness are the cool. ones I like. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the long-form interviews that yeah. you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, I like them too. So Brews and Views is a good one. Uh, the guy's name is Matt Broyette from, I believe his group is called uh, it's Commonwealth... Chamber of Entrepreneurs, that's what they're called. Um, but it's a spinoff from the Commonwealth Foundation. He used to work for them, and now he went to this lobbying group. Commonwealth Foundation is one of those groups that just does research, and they recommend things to us based on what they find. Mm. Um, so he has a lot of good perspective, and then he does these long-form interviews with people, and a lot of them are house members, so I get to see what my colleagues are thinking, what drives them what yeah. motivates them. It's a lot of fun. And there's only so much you can get from those TV interviews that are like a minute long and 10 people are talking over each other and yelling and stuff. Yes. You know, whatever station it's on. It's always just like, I don't think I learned anything there. Absolutely. That's why I'm here. I love this kind of format. <laughs> yeah. So one thing I'm really curious about, can you just like walk us through what like a typical day and session is like in the house? Like, are you just sitting there listening to speeches mostly, doing your own takes or what's Sometimes happening? giving the speeches. Giving the speeches. Uh, but- yeah, it's it's tough. It's totally different from a day here. So I spend about half. It's about half and half Harrisburg and here. Um, I'm in Harrisburg three days a week, three weeks a month, and then here the other time. Um, do, you know, going to meetings, going to certain public events, and things like that. Because in addition to wanting me to listen, people also want to see me. Uh, you know, I need to show that I'm trying to listen to them. Um, but and you know, after we pass the budget, we're usually out for July and August. And we're supposed to be doing community events and things like that. So I'm doing a lot of local things here. Fairs, carnivals, everything you name it, you'll see me there. (laughs) Um, But in Harrisburg, it's a lot of fun because you're pulled in seven different directions at once. And I am a little bit ADHD. You can tell by just the way that I talk and the fact that my answers have been 10 minutes long sometimes. (laughs) Um, And so I like that. They actually put me on five committees in Harrisburg and I sometimes end up with five com- you know three committees at the same time and so you're going to one for 20 minutes then another one for 20 minutes mm. maybe asking a question maybe just absorbing um real quick what are the five committees that you're on so i'm on judiciary and ag that i already mentioned mm. um, and ag is really cool because it's ag and rural affairs so we do a lot with rural broadband funding and things like that as well which is important for things like this podcast <laughs> um, so i'm on judiciary ag and rural affairs health human services and children and youth so i already got to mention my Health and human services interests as well, um, and children, youth is important with the foster system and and things like uh, custodianship of children, things like that, it can get pretty contentious sometimes. But it's interesting at least. Um, so it's typically committee meetings and meetings back in my office up until eleven o'clock, um, and that can go, you know, typically seven thirty to eleven or so. Um, sometimes nine to eleven, just depends on what I have scheduled. Um, and I love that because you're learning about so many different issues, sometimes not even related to my committees, uh, but it might pertain to an upcoming vote we're taking in the house or something like that. It's just a lot of fun to learn about. And then 11 o'clock, we actually go into session. And in the United States, you'll, if you watch C-SPAN, it always focuses on the speaker because mm-hmm. there's never anybody actually sitting in the seats <laughs> listening to, be, to, to debate. Well, you know, where, where the United States Congress is more like a college class, the state house is more like a fourth grade class where attendance is mandatory. It's We can get excused, but if you're in the house that day, you have to be there to vote. And we all have assigned seats. Um, so then we're down listening to debate on issues. And sometimes it takes two hours a day and we're out by one or two o'clock. And you know, recently when we were doing the budget, we were in a few nights until 11 p.m. at night. And you're debating issues and... You know, you're talking to your colleagues on the side. You know, you can go off the floor and have conversations. If you're trying to negotiate a certain piece of legislation, 
and it's just a lot of fun. So it's it's debate from there, and you're listening to people with different ideas than you or the same ideas from you, what they think. You're advocating for your own bills, things like that. Um, and then sometimes, sometimes if you adjourn early, you'll have committee meetings after session as well. So you'll go back and talk about bills in the committees. So what happens is you have to vote something out of committee, and the committee you're expected to kind of be a subject matter on those issues. And then it goes to the full floor for discussion and debate and ultimately voting. And just for, in layman's terms, things have to pass both the House and the Senate. Then they go to the governor, who is like the president of Pennsylvania. Mm. And so once we pass things, if it's already gone through the Senate, it goes on to him uh, or it goes over to the Senate so they can run it. And just because there's a lot more of us, we are actually able to pass a lot more bills than the Senate can because there are less of them and they can focus on less issues. So it's a lot of fun. That was a long answer. Is there much like change of thinking at all between individuals and um, you know like representatives or senators or do do people ever change their viewpoints much on these bigger issues or is the only way that that's changing really going to be by electing new people? So like say let's take for example like um, legalization of medical marijuana. Is that something that individuals in um, that are already in office that they ever change their mind based on these speeches and things like that or is it always just stand still until the next group gets in that is actually medical marijuana is probably the most excellent example i can think of of this because 10 years ago medical marijuana was illegal in pennsylvania and now i think it was 2015 we made it legal um and a lot of the people from 2008 to 2015 are a lot of the same people in office but 2008, it wasn't going to happen because there wasn't the political will to make it happen and people didn't support it. But then over time, a lot of people go into this for the right reasons. Whether they're in it still for the right reasons or not, it's debatable. But a lot of people go in this thinking that they want to do best by their community and serve their community to the best of their, bil- best of their ability, etc. So medical marijuana is a good example. It is When the research came out that it can help people with chronic pain and seizures and things like that, a lot of legislators that were totally opposed to marijuana before, and they might still be totally opposed to recreational marijuana now, came around on that issue. And it ended up passing a Republican House and Senate and signed into law by a Democratic governor, I believe. Right. Um, and so that's that's a good example is um, a lot of people do change. Sometimes they don't change their thinking in the face of science. You see that with a lot of climate change issues and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, which I won't denigrate any of my Republican colleagues or anything like that, but you do see that. Sure. Um, but at the same time, there are certain times issues where people do change their opinions over time. And I think it's more of the overall cultural and mindset in Harrisburg that does get stuck with people staying there for 20, 30 years, that people get stuck in the same way of thinking, where they might change their thinking on certain issues, but it's we're going to keep doing the budget this way because it's the way we've always done it. We're going to keep doing committees this way. And it's the overall cultural shift that needs to happen rather than certain issues where people sometimes do change their points of view. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing that's neat is Pennsylvania is just such an incredibly diverse state. Obviously somebody like me and somebody from Philadelphia thinks differently, but also if you take a Democrat from Philadelphia and a Democrat from Scranton and you pick them out of a pile, they probably believe totally differently on issues too or if you pull me from a pile and a republican from bucks county it's probably two totally different issues or there's lots of republicans in pittsburgh actually probably totally different viewpoint on issues and it's just a lot of fun because anybody can get elected they tell you that when you're a little kid but it's literally true in the pennsylvania house of representatives we have some quite interesting people (laughs) and they all come from totally different walks of life and their constituencies believe totally different things, even among the parties, and that's a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. So this kind of uh, so so you said that you represent Juniata and part of Franklin, and part of Mifflin County. Yes. Um, are you still open to hearing people's viewpoints from all over the state, since you are a state re- your representative? So if somebody from Pittsburgh, or like one of my friends in Pittsburgh, wanted to get in contact with you about something that they wanted to see, would they go? Would they? specifically go to their representative there or can they come to anybody within the state yes and no so that's i will still listen to them Uh, because uh for example um they would have a different perspective that a person in juniata county wouldn't have and that's important to get at the same time i am 
I was elected to represent these areas mm-hmm. and it's me carrying their voice to Harrisburg. And so I will give a lot more credence to what somebody from around here says than someone uh, from a different area. But for example, on the health committee, we had a hearing on oral health in January, uh, you know, teeth, mm-hmm. mouth, things in your mouth, things like that. Um, and, you know, there were, I think there was a dentist from Pittsburgh. There was an oral surgeon from Scranton, something like that. I made that up, but from that, basically that effect. <laughs> yeah. And we don't have people around here with that expertise. We have a few dentists and that's about it. Um, and so there are people from different parts of the state that have totally different expertise that you need to learn from. Okay that don't exist around here, but at the same time, I am in Harrisburg to carry this voice, the Juniata Mifflin Franklin County voice to Harrisburg, and that's the most important thing to me. Awesome. Do we want to get into any specific issues that we want to talk about? Um, Because I know there was, I had a couple questions about different things, but uh, I don't know, like your take on them. Um, So I saw recently there's, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it got passed in the Senate, but there's a bill about um, PAs and nurse practitioners being able to practice on their own without a physician um, supervision. Do you know anything about that bill and what your take on that is? I know about the bill, and I'm sorry this does sound like a cop out, but I'm still learning. Okay. Because it did pass the Senate, but we have not taken it up in the House yet, and so that means we haven't even discussed it once on on the Health Committee okay. yet. So I'm still learning. If you have opinions, I'm happy to. Hear and then them. second, we already talked about the medical marijuana thing. Yes. But I know we had. Um, Fetterman was here in Juniata County um, talking about possible recreational uh, legalization in the state. What's your take on that? I actually inadvertently generated a little bit of controversy because of that issue. (laughs) Because I went to his hearing in Juniata County, um, but I didn't attend in Franklin County. And someone asked me and another Franklin County legislator who didn't attend why. And we made the comment kind of offhandedly that it was a political sham and that we felt like he wasn't actually going around to listen. And that got a little bit controversial because he obviously is. Um, but when I went to the one here in Juniata County, there were about 100 people there. But 30 to 40 were from the Harrisburg or Harrisburg suburbs, uh, okay. I noticed. And then also, it's the lieutenant governor's event. Of course, I was invited and the commissioners were invited and we all sat up front. But that's like obviously the people that are going to show up to a John Hershey fundraiser, support John Hershey. The type of people that show up to a recreational marijuana event are people that support recreational marijuana. <laughs> yeah. And so it was kind of a – statistics matter to me as an economics major. And it was kind of a, a sampling error bias, uh, it, what happened there. Whereas, you know, for example – I pulled the issue later on the telephone town hall that I did. Telephone town halls are landlines, so the average person answering the phone and actually listening to me might be 70 or 80 years old. And that pulled totally differently, where it was probably 60-40 for recreational marijuana when the governor came here. When I pulled it on landlines, it was 90 to 10 against, or 82 to 18 against, or something like that. Okay. And it's just a total sampling bias. Mm-hmm. And so... It is my opinion that the people of Juniata, Mifflin Counties, and Franklin Counties aren't for recreational marijuana. And I've had so many people call me with studies about how it can affect cognitive ability. Um, And a lot of police are concerned because you can't can't test it like you can a breathalyzer when you do a normal traffic stop. And there are standardized test scores that are going down. And of course, if we legalize recreational marijuana... Nobody wants it getting in the hands of kids, and a lot of kids are vaping and things like that now. Yeah. And so there's just a lot of public health concerns in my mind that we're not quite ready for it. And I do think that Juniata, Mifflin, and Franklin counties agree with me, even though the lieutenant governor thinks that they don't. He thinks that we're all for it. He, you know, he, and he said he made this kind of comment when – so that got published, and then we ended up doing an op-ed about it, me and the other Franklin County representatives. Um that got into the Chambersburg public opinion and things like that. And, um, and the Lieutenant governor responded something along the lines of, well, all Republicans support this. So they're not even listening to their own people. (laughs) And that is not what I've been hearing on the ground here. Um, you know, that might be 
the case in his one experience with Juniata County that he's ever had in his life. <laughs> but again, I am here to represent my people to bring the views of Juniata, Mifflin, and Franklin counties to Harrisburg. And I don't think that our area is ready for that kind of thing. So sure. that's that's where I come from at the base level. And then there's all these other medical concerns as well. So that's where I'm at, but it's, it's fine if you disagree. That's yeah. what we're here for. I don't think this comes from a Republican or a Democratic agenda, but from the eyes of a lot of millennials, it seems like a lot of people our age just view it as inevitable that either at the state level or maybe someday at the federal level yes. will legalize recreational marijuana. Would you agree with that? it's? I something- do actually see it as inevitable. Um, and you talked about the federal level, and that brings up another point as to why I don't think I can support it now, is that it's still a federally scheduled Schedule C1, one drug. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And that means that there are certain things, you know, businesses can't get certain types of insurance because of that scheduling because the banks won't insure you. Um, you know, you can still not be admitted to the military, things like that, if you're smoking marijuana. You can't, there are certain things you can't do at the federal level. And I do think that before Pennsylvania ever takes it up, that the federal government needs to address it because at its face, this has not been overturned by the courts. But in my opinion, it is unconstitutional if we were to do something because the federal government has already said, no, this isn't going to happen. So I think that the federal government needs to do something. Um, But I think that they might eventually. And a lot of my even Republican colleagues say, hey, there's a lot of tax revenue to be gained here. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania could bring in an extra $100 million, $200 million a year, just like we do with taxing liquor and things like that. So it might happen. And I'm willing to have conversations about it. I have not been closed-minded. Like I said, I will always listen to people. But I just don't think that it really jives with what this area wants. And so for now, I do not support it. Um, But I have had conversations with people who do that are perfectly reasonable. And in that same way you brought up about how if we legalized it at the state level and it's not federally, like there's a whole mumbo jumbo about what do you actually do with businesses. And we did legalize it medicinally. Is there any sort of paradox there with physicians can't quote unquote prescribe it like they have to give the cards so because it's a class one so the since the DEA I believe yeah. is federal licensure correct so yeah. so they couldn't like prescribe it they can only offer the cards yeah that's correct yeah there's there's been some issues there um, and then there are people there are also physicians that have claimed to be doctors for dubious purposes for issuing cards and things like that <laughs> that we've seen. And there, and then we also see people that are training people how to get medical cards, which is fine if you have a legitimate reason to have one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's just a lot of issues with that federal scheduling that we still have to work out. Or should I say they have to work out in Washington before I think we should address it here. So just out of curiosity then, are physicians protected in PA for giving out those medical marijuana cards or is there any sort of pitfalls on their own like DEA licensure since it's illegal federally? Yes and no. Um, so I hate to give you the political answer again. <laughs> but so they are they are uh, protected in terms of Pennsylvania law. We allow those licenses and things like that. The federal government does not. But DEA hasn't been enforcing those kinds of licenses where the state legalizes it. But they could if they wanted to. But they could if they wanted to. So they haven't been. Um, and so people... Be pretty messed up if they just <laughs> decided to start Yes, yes. Yeah. So and I don't think the DEA would ever unilaterally crack down like that. Um, and Donald Trump is a pretty conservative president and has not had them do that. And DEA is under his peer view. Um, and so I don't think it will ever happen, but it is possible. Gotcha. Awesome. So if people want to learn more about your viewpoints and everything, or if they want to get in contact with you, how can they find you? Yes. Uh, the best place to go is rephershey.com. It's easy enough. Um, and that has my press releases and my links to my Facebook page, things like that. I do have two Facebook pages, one for my campaign and one for my legislative purposes. And that's just because you can't use taxpayer dollars to benefit yourself, basically. Um, so Facebook website, you can email me through the website and that email goes directly to me. Uh, and then my email address is jhershey at 
pahousegop.com. So again, that's jhershey at pahousegop.com. And then my Mifflin Town office, the phone number there is 717-436-6001. And I try to return all phone calls that I get or take meetings directly. Um, that's something that might change as the volume comes in. But for now, if people call me about a one-off issue and they have a legitimate concern, I've tried to return their phone calls. So hopefully I've, I've I preached accessibility during my race, positivity, accessibility, listening ear. So I have been trying my best to provide that sort of thing. Sounds good. Anything else you want to put out there before we wrap this up? I don't think so. You guys covered a yeah. lot of ground here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Just speaking for myself, I feel like I learned a lot, not just about your platform, but about how state politics operate in general. Really grateful for you coming on. Thanks. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, and I would love to see more people our age get involved. That's Again, that's one of the reasons I did this in the first place. Awesome. I think we just uh, got a new record long podcast. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hopefully thanks that's so a good thing. Yeah, thanks so much <laughs> right. for joining us. Right. See everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening, everybody. You can find us on Facebook at Insights of All Trades. Find us on Instagram at Insights of All Trades. Twitter is IOAT Podcast. And send us your insights via email at insightsofalltrades at gmail.com. You can also DM us if you have some insights, and we'll include you at the beginning of the podcast. Thanks again. See you soon.